Hello, I'm Scott Clover, and you're listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast. This podcast series is about intuition, healing, and creating new energetic patterns that benefit you in your daily life. In my private practice, I help people heal from a diverse range of issues, including self-acceptance, trauma release, managing anxiety, emboldening self-worth, and creative expression. In today's episode, we discuss energy systems, the power of extreme words, overcoming self-doubt, how childhood patterns and other people's energies weigh us down, and ways you can be more aware of your own energy and conditioned patterns in order to heal them. Enjoy! Carl Munson here. It's so good to be speaking to Scott again. Scott, it's season three, episode one. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Yes, people were asking, when is season three coming out? Well, now. Here it is, right. Okay. Here it is. They were asking for it, so we're going to give some good information today. Yeah, and catch up, I think, a little bit. I'll cover some old ground. And we're going to talk about energy naturally, because you're an intuitive energy guy. And we're going to be talking about the chakras. And we're going to be talking about how to put this, what sounds like esoteric stuff, into everyday language for everyday use, right? Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Making the energetic a little more palpable yes. to the everyday yeah. Because it's, it's all there in our language, isn't it? On the one hand, people, you know, you might hear that somebody like yourself is a, an energy worker, an intuitive healer, and think, oh, energy, you know, that's a bit out there. But it's it's throughout our language, isn't it? People, just people walking into a room are, are aware of energies, right? So it's much more prevalent and normal than anyone would imagine. Correct. And what I wanted to talk about today is how easily we have implemented conditions and terminology and vernacular expressions into our daily lives that are describing the energy that I see in and around people's bodies. So when I work with a client, I try to break them down either into a hologram or even that hologram into quadrants. So I break that energy down into different areas and I can see it easier and describe it easier when it's more uh, localized, I should say. Okay. So each quadrant means something to me in terms of why is someone stuck or why is the energy clamoring onto them in certain places. But what's interesting to me is when people speak of energy and chakras, they may never use the word chakra, but yet the terminology is everywhere in our, in, in our vernacular, in our expressions. You know, get off my back or there's a monkey on my back or I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. Um... I feel like I have a gut instinct or I feel that in my guts or I don't like that person. You know, he turns my stomach or butterflies, heartaches. You know, we describe heartaches. Um, there's even a, a medical terminology for when your heart chakra closes and they can't describe it. So they don't use the word chakra. One of my clients recently told me that years ago she was diagnosed with heartache. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's actually just sort of a severing or a, a, a schism in your heart chakra that they can't describe by modern medicine. So she was actually diagnosed with a heartache. Wow. And I thought, we talk about this stuff every day in our language. Yes. You know, that gets under my skin. Well, that just means the energy isn't being reciprocal or you're not sending the energy out or you're feeling confined somehow. Yes, yes. Indeed. Right? So we take it in, and if we don't we don't want to experience it or share it, then it remains under our skin. So that person gets under our skin. Yes, or it might go over our heads. Or it might go over our heads. It, it's into your seventh chakra, and you can't sort of bring it into your body. You know, we talk about how many terms about feeling grounded. Well, yes. if you've ever been to a yoga class or a session with me, we are going to do some sort of grounding exercise that you feel the earth's energy and you connect to that or vice versa. So it's everywhere we speak. And more and more so, right? People are taking their shoes off. People are wanting to earth, um, connect themselves. I mean, even on beds, you know, people are connecting their, their beds to earth. I, I, do all, I do all of those things. I take my shoes off outside as much as possible. I have a, a, a grounding mat that's connected to the, the grounding cord that goes into the uh, socket at the house. Yeah, um, if I'm working with clients, I generally try and stay as grounded as possible. And that's not only just for my safety, but also my comfort. You know, I don't need to do as much cleaning after work if I'm staying grounded while I'm working. And that can go for anybody, whether you're working on a computer or you have an anxious meeting with your boss on Zoom. Your boss doesn't need to know you're sitting on a grounding mat or your shoes are off on a grounding mat. It just means you're presenting yourself as grounded as you can and you're using aids or things to help you. 
Amazing. So you again, we're using an energetic term of cleaning there, aren't we? You weren't talking about physically housekeeping cleaning. You were talking about the energetic housekeeping, if you like, bodily cleaning, energetic cleaning. Can you tell us a bit more about that? And if you will, bring that into the, the demystification of chakras as well. Sure. Well, people say they feel uh, pixelated or scattered. That just means the energy generally in your auric field, the layers outside your body, aren't aligning with what's what they're intending to align with or connect to. So I have a lot of clients that when they say, oh, I'm not getting along with my child, for example, I say, well, your child's third shock or third auric field is scratchy and yours is pliable. So they get in there and they, they grade it. You, you two grade at one another. So if you're aware of your energy a little more subtly, and that can be auric fields outside your body or the chakra system inside your body, The way I describe this to my clients is the chakras are the projectors in a movie theater, the the bright light bulb projecting the the image out into the room, okay? And the auric levels, the auric layers, if you will, they are the screen. If you don't have a screen, then the energy from the light bulb just goes off into the distance and gets dissipated and, and it's not tangible, Right. But the auric layers are our screen, which means we're presenting our our chakra energy in the real world. Now, if your screen is dirty or somebody throws popcorn and soda at it, then you've got splotches on your auric field. Right. So you're not seeing the full image. So either you're you can have dust on your projector, which is your chakras. They can be dirty or soiled or, or clogged. But you can also have an auric field that's smoky or cloudy. Imagine 18 people smoking in the movie theater. Well, the the image on the screen won't be as clean. So if, you've, if you're bringing in 18 other people's energies that you work with and your kids and your grandparents and you know that awful family member that you can't stand, all of those people are inside of your auric field if you let them and you have to clean that out. Sometimes I have people use the imagery of like an exhaust fan in a smoky kitchen. And you take some of that pixelating energy out of your auric field or that smoke out of your auric field. So once again, the chakras can be the projector or the light bulb presenting the energy out into the world. And then the auric field can be the screen that's that it's showing on. And and the cleaner both of those are, the better you're going to feel. Frankly. Well, well, just as in the 70s and 80s, people thought maybe it's not such a good idea to have a cinema full of smoke. We're trying to yeah. watch a movie here. And it's unthinkable now, isn't it, that that would happen? But it did. It really did, didn't it? People were smoking inside cinemas and we couldn't see the screen sometimes. Now we have that same metaphor, don't we? If you can clear it. You don't have to put up with it anymore. And this is the work you're doing. Correct. It's the work I do habitually or weekly with my clients, but it's also just things I would like people to know about on this podcast. You know, this podcast I created so people understand energy just a little easier and a little more subtly than they did before listening to it. And these are a lot of things that I wish I would have known about when I was sort of coming up in the energy world. These are things that no one talked about. And that's definitely what we're, what we're heading into. But um, let's finish up with the, the wording of, of things. Mm -hmm. So just some homework for people is pay attention to the words you're using. And are you describing something energetic? Are you describing something in your body or your chakras or your auric field by very simple energetic expressions? You know, one is I didn't see that coming or I got stabbed in the back. That's because other people's energies comes at us from behind. I call it nature's mud flaps or the chakra mud flaps. (laughs) It's okay. So, so the chakras are extending out backwards as well, are they? As well as this frontal projection. Yeah, I perceive them as tubes. So it's almost like two two trombones looking away from one another. They they sort of receive energy in the front and they send energy out the back, or they receive energy in the back and send it back out the front. If you're so if you so choose to, and if they're clean enough. So a lot of times with people who have a spiritual malaise. This is my clients that are coming to me with saying, I, I just don't know how to connect to my energy. We'll find one or several of their chakras are quite clogged and there's, there's energetic and somatic exercises we can do to clean those specific chakras out. But the thing I want to talk to today is just a generality of the back of the chakras. We as human beings are more likely to clean off your auric field and your chakra field by what you can physically see with your eyeballs. 
meaning more people think about the front of their hand that they can see than the back of their knee, which they can't. Ah, uh, yes. So when people are, when I'm asking people, hey, let's do a chakra clearing or an auric field cleaning, or let's see where your energy is either coagulated or could need some, some buffering or buffing, I should say. Generally, they'll look everywhere but behind them. And it's what's interesting for me in my work is no one speaks about this. I've, I've tried to find other practitioners out there that speak about this, and it would be very rare that, that another person I'm, I'm paying attention to out in the industry is talking about how clamored and, and congested the back of the chakras get. So if you wanna just close your eyes and imagine over time, People are throwing energy at you, but it comes from behind, almost like mud splotches, and it gets crusty and dried on the back of our energy fields. Either that's right on your back or just right off your back. Mm. And I use the metaphor of like an Italian sculptor or a, a, a car in Minnesota in wintertime where you have to scrape all the ice off of it. So imagine just the back of the chakras just start being interacted with. I can actually really feel that. Yeah, most people can, once they pay attention, realize how congested it can be. And generally, it's from other people over the years. People judging us, people demeaning us, teasing, um, having to stand up for ourselves amongst our friends or family. All that congestion gets stuck behind us. And if you take the time and energy to notice it, you can actually clean it off and feel lighter and are essentially brighter. That's a great bit of homework there. And that's what yeah. you want people to have a listen to. You know that expression, will you just listen to yourself? This is you we're listening to our own languaging within this context of understanding this the 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 the, the back of life rather than because we it just in the same way that we read from from right to left, we look at mm -hmm. life as though it's coming towards us, right? And we and, and as you said there, we're not really aware of this this onslaught from from the back. Correct. Well, and it's the same way the Europeans speak of their month and day and year, the way Americans differ. So Americans speak it the way they write it, and so do Europeans. And they they don't change it. Yes. And without checking your habit and the condition and the custom, you could... Right. In Europe, you say 13th of November 2022, because that's the way it's written. But in America, you say, you know, August 14th. Yes. Okay. The way it's written. So our language creates our reality. But yes. what I'm trying to get people to understand is the language also describes the reality created by the energy which makes up matter. Yes. Yes. So it's kind of a loop. Is language creating our reality? Or are we describing in language what we see and sense with our third eyes or our intuition? But you don't talk. You can't say that in a business meeting. So we've come up with different terminology to describe energy occurrences, everyday energy and chakra occurrences, but in a vernacular or an expression or a term that is understood by the masses. We are so funny, aren't we, as human beings? And the more you think about what you're saying energetically about your body and what's around you, the more you'll realize how often you speak of chakra and auric energy without actually using those two phrases. Wonderful. So keep an eye on that, folks. And the intention here, Scott, this is important, isn't it? Why are we doing this? And and I think it's fair to say you just want people to enjoy their lives, right? What would be wrong with that? Right. So that's the thing about other people's energies is they get stuck to us like a backpack. Well, if you're carrying a backpack full of other people's energies around, you're going to get weighted down and then your day is going to feel more fatiguing just because you're still carrying that stuff on your back where the other people put it, sent it, or splattered it on you. So once again, this is to remind people that your chakras are sort of universal. They're, they may be considered in the center of the body, but they spread out front, back, sideways. And, and pay attention to when and if you're cleaning them. You're not just cleaning what you can see with your eyeballs. Actually, either try to leave your body or turn around in your mind's eye and look behind you and spend just as much, if not more time cleaning off the backs of your chakras than you do just the front or the parts you can see. Now you can do this several ways. You can do it in a shower with the salt scrub and you can actually throw salt on your back and then take a towel and, 
have the salt scrub your back and thinking you're cleaning off that auric and, and charcoal energy in the back. You can let the water run in the shower behind you and imagine it's being cleaned off. Or just visualize light hitting it, like you're laying on a beach and the sun is coming down. Any of those three simple visualizations will help you start cleaning off your chakras and enjoying life more. And the way you're enjoying life more is those judgments and those energies, those look down on from people, always mostly get stuck. I would say, yeah, mostly get stuck on our backs that we don't notice it. And by doing these things, yeah, you will find yourself enjoying life more. Scott, that is such good access. Um, yeah. you, you've, re you've really helped there because, again, in the, in the front-facing world of personal development, it's like, I'm doing my intentions. I've got my dream board. I'm looking forward to the future. I'm positive. But if you don't attend to that because you literally don't look at it because you're you, not – You not literally just, don't look at it. Correct. Yes, Most there, people don't. It's there holding you back, holding you back. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Like a backpack or what I, I use the terminology of parachute. A lot of times our youthful subconscious and then our, our adolescent subconscious is full of safety mechanisms like a parachute that safely brings us into adulthood. And then around the age of 20, no one comes and says, hey, take off that parachute of bullshit that you've got behind you and walk into your life. Most people leave the parachute on and go about their day. Well, what happens when the wind blows? those safety and security measures from your childhood no longer suit the adult, but yet they're clamoring behind you like a parachute on the ground. And so it's hard to walk forward when life, you know, blows wind at you. And you get used to it, right? And you get used to it. You can feel like, and then, as I said, there becomes that spiritual malaise that a lot of people have been feeling lately. Wow. And once again, it has to do with other people, whether that's your family or your peers or the people that were close to you growing up. Enjoying life, cleaning off the backs of your chakras. How are they related? Well, as I said, other people's energies get stuck to our back and weigh us down. But also, you were saying vision board and intentions and all these other things. It would be really great if people, A, used the right words with setting intentions. That's one way to enjoy life. And the other way is to uh, realize who is limiting your idea of enjoying life. So let's start with the first one. If you're setting an intention or you're speaking of energy and you're using an extreme word, all or nothing, something very binary, that will negate your very affirming intention that you have, you have the best intentions of setting an intention that's going to be positive for you. But if you use an extreme word and now there are millions of people out there setting intentions using extreme words and there's people in my industry that are have millions of followers and are making millions of dollars that are setting out, unfortunately, intentions that are verbally or semantically a little fractured. And so you're giving the universe a fractured statement and the universe doesn't like those. The universe really prefers, it's kind of like the genie in the bottle, you need to be as precise as possible and, and, and refined as possible with your terminology so the universe can meet you where you are. What do I mean by that? If you say, oh, I, I leave the house and I always put my keys in my left pocket. Well, last week you left and you put your keys in the right pocket. So you just spoke an incongruous expression. You didn't mean to, but you said always. And that's not true because last week you did, you did something different than that pattern. So that's not a true statement. A lot of times I hear people say, take all the negative energy out of my life from my ex-husband. Well, then you're not, your subconscious is, you're, you're asking your subconscious to forget parts of your life that created who you are. So it's more like integrate the fears and concerns that happened to me from my ex-husband so they don't trigger me anymore or they don't, feel con they don't feel traumatic. But if you're saying take away all of something, that's generally not possible. Now, maybe there's an instance where that would be possible. Fill me with all the love. Well, I want to be filled with other things other than love. So I don't want to be all love. That, that would tip me over. That would tip over, over anybody filled all with love. Yeah. So it's these extreme expressions which are very well intended. Don't get me wrong. And the people saying them think they're doing correctly. But if you really distill the words down and you ask the universe to meet you where you are, you, you're not giving 
you're not leaving open what could be optimal. That's the term I use or prefer is something optimal, meaning what's just as not good for you, but that's also good for other people that would serve you. So at the same time, you're gonna feel better overall than you would have say, I wanna experience all the love or I want my village or my neighborhood to experience all the love. Well, they have to experience some negative and some shadow work or else they're not going to feel balanced and know what's hitting them or happening to them. Yeah. So once again, one thing you can do is set your intentions correctly. And that is create intentions using words that aren't extreme and aren't uh, defined by everything and all, all at once, if you will. Yes, yes, yes. Extremity. So perhaps uh, the, the, the extended homework is to have people... Uh, be a little bit more relaxed and discerning about their their aims discernment energetic discernment is amazing and one way you can be energetic discernment is choose the right words you're using if you choose the right words you're using to describe energy then you will become more discerning with your energy and that's something once again i teach a lot of my clients about is discernment just because we're intuitive or empathic doesn't mean we have to pick up everything yes i want to pick up about five percent and the rest I don't need or want to experience. Yeah. So I'm not asking the universe for me to pick up all of the frequencies. No, I want to pick up the frequencies that are either going to aid me or my clients that I'm working with. I don't need to pick up everything else. I would actually prefer not to pick up everything else. Yeah. So when I first started sort of coming back into my energetic prowess and seeing fields and things, I remember I was living in Manhattan and I decided I don't want to see colors. I think seeing colors would be too overwhelming for me. So I just decided, oh, I'm seeing auric fields and I'm seeing other things. I'm just going to leave colors out of it. Now I can discern when I'm doing energy work, you know, remotely, I can discern fuchsia from cyan and blue from yellow. I just don't physically see it in my mind's eye because to me that would seem over just too much energy, too many things to perceive yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. So I generally see in my mind's eye black and white and I'm fine with that. I don't need it to be more refined. So everything all at once, all of those kinds of terms, please be prudent in the words that you're using when you're setting your intentions and, and think of things that are going to be optimal for you and the family, your family, the people around you, and not maybe an extreme word or terminology, because that unfortunately breaks the contract you're actually trying to make with the universe. Fascinating. I, yeah. I think that's, that's probably enough homework for everybody. And I'm aware that I am I am probably overwhelming you. And I, as you know, um, I could talk to you all day about this. And um, we ha we are in season three. This is episode one. And there will be further episodes to further unpack things. So perhaps we shouldn't, I shouldn't be tr trying to draw too much out of you today. Yeah, there is one concept I want to I want to finish up with, though, about how to enjoy life a little better. You brought it up, actually, about uh, setting your intention with your vision boards and and putting out there. This is what I want from the universe. Well, as we know, if you listen to any podcast about the law of intention, wanting something will keep you wanting it. It will sort of keep it at, at fingertips length that you can almost grasp it, but you're going to keep wanting it. So one way is to be it. The other way is to understand who are you being for in your life. Let me rephrase that. Who are you asking permission or allowing yourself change from? So what I'm realizing a lot recently with my clients is I want to change my life for the better, they say. Okay, well, who's stopping you? Well, maybe it's me. And I say, well, yeah, maybe it's you, but maybe it's your psyche thinking it's someone else. So if you say to yourself, oh, I want to enjoy life and I'm being blocked, what would happen if I enjoyed life? Say it out loud. What would happen if I enjoyed life? And be curious about it. Yes. And see what happens. But the other most important message I've been asking people to, to find is, who would I be letting down if I enjoyed my life? That's pretty profound, isn't it? Yeah. There, there may well be an answer to that. And it's generally somebody from your upbringing. It's generally somebody from your upbringing that needed or wanted you to be a certain way that you didn't need or want to be, and you conformed yourself to them. Now, a lot of people that listen to my podcast are empaths and have grown up around challenging incidences, shall we say, or challenging people. And one of the things you can ask yourself is, oh, am I not enjoying myself because I'm protecting someone else? 
And a lot of times when you ask that question, the person that you're protecting is long dead. Yeah. The person's either not in your life anymore or they're dead or they don't have the same power over you that they did when you decided that. And you generally decided that before the age of seven. So your subconscious remembers who it is, but you as an adult don't remember who it is or why. Because our subconscious is formed before the age of seven, before we have cause effect rationale. Then after seven, our, our subconscious is kind of fully formed and then we know or not know not how to react to certain things. And that's why we have more memories after the age of, well, our, our age group seven, younger kids today, it's happening a little earlier around six. Wow. Or 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years later even, we might still be running according to that software. Correct. Running to, oh, if I enjoy myself, I use the term dry my wings off. If I dry my wings off and fly, maybe my older sister won't like that because they're self-conscious. Or maybe you were smarter than someone in your family and your cousin resented you, so you didn't want your cousin to feel bad, so you played dumb. Yeah. But you're not dumb, and now 30 years later, you need to get that new job, but yet when you interact with people, you kind of feel stupid and you act stupid because that's made your cousin feel better. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, that's all in the subconscious, and those patterns repeat and repeat and repeat. So a lot of times what I've been doing recently with clients is asking them, who would you challenge if you enjoyed your life? And you can, you can formulate this, this sentence any way you'd like to. But it generally comes down to there's somebody in your past or somebody in your upbringing that would feel resentful if you experienced joy or something decent in your life. And that person is still controlling or the idea of that person is still controlling your subconscious enough to thwart you or keep you from connecting to a future. And tell us, Scott, it is possible to let go of that. Very much so. The, the most important part is observing it and hearing that oh shit moment in your head when you're like, what the heck? What? what? <laughs> that kid that used to steal my lunch money, like whoever it was, is somehow yes. in your brain still and you may have long forgotten that person. But yet... But they've still... certainly forgotten you, right? Oh, most certainly. Or they wouldn't have ever realized that they had such a negative impact on your psyche. Yeah, it yeah. could just have been, as I said, you know, a hierarchical bullying brother, fraternal sister thing, um, familial energy that, oh, my mom was depressive. If I act, if I acted too joyful in my household, then she would steal my joy from me. So I just decided not to act. I decided not to act joyful. And then that just became a pattern. But inside, you know, you're full of joy, but somehow you're keeping it under your skin and you're not expressing it. There, I brought it full circle. See what I did And it's here? not too late. It's not too late. Scott, thank you for telling us it's okay to enjoy our lives today. <laughs> it really is. Please, give yourself permission. That's a parental act. Give yourself permission. To break the parental bond, you say, I give myself permission to enjoy life. Amazing. If you limited yourself, you say, I allow, I allow myself to enjoy life. And then see what happens. Oh, just one more thing, Scott, if I may. Please. Um, coming out intuitive. Um, is it is it okay at this stage to tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I have a class coming up that you can find on my website or in the show notes um, called Coming Out Intuitive. And I'll be teaching sort of the principles that I talk about on this uh, podcast, as well as other things to help people feel more secure in who they are. Um, self-exception, self-accepting, I should say, let me start over. Self-accepting is so important in, with intuition for a lot of the reasons why we talked about today. You know, God forbid your little seven-year-old psyche says, well, if I let my intuition out, I'm going to hurt somebody, right? That happens to so many of us that had intuition growing up that we, something happened to us that we became self-conscious about it. And so I'm designing this class around people that want to self-accept, their intuition. They already know that they're intuitive or empathic, but it's a way of accepting it for themselves and then not having those limited beliefs sort of clamored onto them by other people. So it's a nice segue actually about what we talked about today. Wonderful, wonderful. So yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. I think that's a lovely high point to end on, if that's okay with you. We will be Please. back, of course. Um, so thank you so much. So good to be talking to you again. Looking forward to uh, episode two already. Right on. Thanks a lot, Carl. You've been listening to the Intuitive Energy Podcast with me, Scott Clover. Thanks to Carl Munson for the great discussion and to Corey Tutt for the music you're listening to. In my private practice, 
I encourage people to heal what holds you back and feel better in your body. If you need more help with that process, I'm available for healing sessions by phone internationally. Visit scottclover.com for more information. Be well, and thanks for listening. This podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and solely as a self-help tool for your own use. I'm not providing medical, psychological, or nutrition therapy advice. You should not use this information to diagnose or treat any health problems or illnesses without consulting your own medical practitioner. Always seek the advice of your own medical practitioner and or mental health provider about your specific health situation. For my full disclaimer, please go to scottclover.com disclaimer.